not going to learn everything, but I actually have, if, if you want more, I have an hour and a half YouTube Q&A that he did on, on this topic, which I could share with everybody afterwards. But I know that it's uh, meaningful to me to be able to introduce you to him and for him to be able to directly uh, answer some of your questions and share some of his perspectives um, really as a, really as an insider on the vaccine. Let's, um, Mr. Bravman um, often does on this day. We had uh, Mrs. Bravman's yard site last week, uh, two weeks ago, and actually, thank God, uh, we helped make a minion for him, which was very, very meaningful for him. He hasn't been out of his house much. Ayala, thank you to you and your class for making that happen. And Mayrav. Um, and actually, today is Mrs. Bravman's father's yard site. And he asked me specifically to sponsor, uh, to, to, to dedicate this, this learning in memory of Joseph Simon Zichroli Vracha. Um, so the Torah that we learned until now and the Torah that we're going to learn a little bit and uh, any Torah that you learn today or any meaningful work, work that you do today, if you could keep in mind, Joseph Simon Zichroli Vracha. Um, as part of that, I know that would be very, that is very meaningful to uh, to him. It's a very hard day for me. Yessi Mazarik um, was uh, a neighbor, uh, literally 100 feet from my house, and uh, amazing, beautiful, beautiful family. Um, he's been fighting for four years. Um, they were on the way to a ski trip for his honeymoon four years ago when he when uh, he had to turn around and then eventually got his diagnosis and lost that battle. Um, lost that battle yesterday. Um, my first graduating class. I came here in 2005. He was our first graduating class. The guy's 29 years old and um, beautiful person, beautiful family. He got married um, and was diagnosed within a few months, I think, of that. I think he got married in the summer um, and uh, was diagnosed a few months later. His wife, Sarah, um, his parents, his siblings, Gav and Aviva and Manasha and Michal, you know, many of you know many of them. Um, Penina was a sister-in-law who worked here in the ELC. And just so many, so many connections. And yes, whoever wrote that just now, so painfully, painfully sad to see somebody go. And we should just, Baruch uh, no, you know, that's, that's what the bracha is. The bracha is basically, I have nothing to say. That's what the bracha is. We, we somehow believe that God has... Uh, has some some kind of plan, but sometimes we don't we don't we don't understand it. And, and the best we can do is to say, Baruch Dayan um, Amen. That um, there, there's some truth out there, and maybe 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 the time will come where somebody can make sense of it. But Yehizichro, um, Yehizichro Baruch. That's this is a this is a sad day, and we're with him, uh, with his family in their in their um, tsar and their pain, and they should have only um, comfort. So our transition, but let's. Uh, we, there's a lot of life that was brought into the world, so let's do that. Mazal tov to Nava Bucha on the birth of a uh, baby boy. Mazal tov to Sarah Hass on the birth of a baby girl. Mazal tov to Orna Goldschmidt on the birth of a granddaughter. Mazal tov to Rina Rossman on the birth of a grandson. Mazal tov to Nomi Kane on the birth of a grandson. Mazal tov to Erica Edelman on Shefa's bat mitzvah. Mazal tov to Orit Smith. And to Grandmother Gabi on the engagement of Ariel to Ilana Spivak. That's an SAR couple. Mazal Tov to uh, Michelle Sachs on the engagement of her son, Jacob, to Michal Raskis. And to Aunt Jenny Harwitz, Mazal Tov, Mazal Tov, and great um, to share smachot. If there is something that I'm missing, please, for all of us, put it in, put it in and we'll... Uh, and we'll we'll share smachot and give each other comfort deal together. Condolences nichumin to Tammy Adler on the loss of her beloved father, Dr. Larry Burkhauer Zichonoli Bracha, to Sharon Black on the loss of her mother, Edith Black Zichonoli Bracha, to Dorit Birnbaum on the loss of her father, Morris Birnbaum Zichonoli Bracha, on the loss of Charles Schwartz, Zichon Ali Bracha, a longtime member of the SAR board, father of Alex Schwartz, who was in SAR with me. Um, Bill Spear, William Spear, Zichon Ali Bracha, pillar of the Riverdale Jewish community, uh, grandfather of uh, Atara, founder of SAR Academy. Um, Milton Steinberg, also a founder of the community. This is just this weekend, this just this weekend, a very hard weekend in our, in our community. Um, thank you, Erica. Mazal tov to Ilana Sanger and Rebecca's bat mitzvah. We go from 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 good to hard. But I'm sorry, and the chumin to Chana Shef on the loss of her grandmother. I don't know if she made it out to uh, 
if she made it out to Seattle, I don't know. I know that she was trying to. I hope that she that she did. If she wanted to be there, I hope that she was able to get there. Um, and um, that's what uh, this is what community is all about. So we um, we we really uh, again happy to share smachot together in the way that we share things together these days. Um, and nichumin and comfort. Hopefully, we bring comfort to each other for for the challenges in life and uh, too many these days. Mazal tov, mazal tov, that Deborah Ice and Sammy's bar mitzvah. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. And please, please, I, God forbid, don't want to leave anybody out. And if there's something that we're missing, put it, put it in the chat for everyone to see and for all of us to be able to, for all of us to be able to share together. Um, Rabbi Kraus, can I say something? Of course, Javi, you can always say something. I just want to read a note, one of many notes that we've received from the Sunshine Fund, but I just got this this morning from Sharon. Sure. Thank you. Saying, Dear Sunshine Fund, aka the best faculty ever, I thank you so much for sending along dinner when I was sitting shiver for my mom. Not only was it helpful, I felt the love. I, how great to be part of a team that is so caring, kind, thoughtful, and inspiring. That's one of many, many notes that we get and we've been sending food to staff that are sick, family members that are sick. So we're asking again, if you have not contributed to the Sunshine Fund or would like to add to the Sunshine Fund, this has been a tough year for us. So please, um, you can Venmo at Sunshine Fund at SAR or you can see me or Lynn Zadoff or Lauren Weiser. And in the ELC, you can see Shira Kroll. We really, really, are using the money to good use. Okay, please put that in the, thank you, thank you for that, and put it in the chat so people can can uh, have it, and that would be great to be able to continue supporting each other. It was also Tommy Raguin on the birth of a son. Great, great to hear, great to continue to hear smachot, nichumin to Robin Raskis on the loss of her grandfather, Yizik Rabaruch. Let's again. Let's let's just be with each other and uh, as as a community as as it should be. Um, so I got, as I told you, I got my uh, my first dose that same that same night. Um, and actually, Sharon, um, that morning, Sharon Sturm asked me a shayla. Um, I'm not. I don't usually consider myself a posek, but uh, sometimes people ask me questions. And you know what I do when people ask me halacha questions? Anybody know what do, you, what do I do? You know, Adina hey, Ask your ask your dad. I yeah. call my father. It's exactly what I do. every time. I just like okay, I'll, I'll, I'll call my father. So that's what I that's what I did, but I didn't reach him. So the question was, the question was, uh, <laughs> thank you, Adina. Uh, the question was, uh, do you make a bracha? Do you make a bracha when you get the shot? So there were people talking about whether you should make a bracha when you get the shot. If you recall, we made a shachianu on the first day of school. That was the same. I did. I asked my father that time. And my father is a, my father's a halachic person. So my father, you know, is an emotional person, but he's also a halachic person. So, you know, making a bracha is a big deal. Saying God's name is a big deal. So it's a real halachic question. We don't just throw out God's name for nothing. But I said to my father on the first day of school, I said, this feels like a shachiana moment. If you say a shachiana when you eat like some new fruit on Rosh Hashanah that doesn't even taste good, right? So so you maybe you should make a shachiana for the first day of school. Kids haven't been in school for six months. So, you know, he said to me, he said, wear a new, wear a new tie. I'm like, oh, I don't have a new tie. I haven't bought any clothing in, in a long time. So he, he says, figure it out. And if you wear a new shirt, then you make a shachianu. You haven't mind the shirt and the thing. So he says, that's okay. So that's so we, we did that the first day of school and made a shachianu. But there's another bracha called Hatova Hametiv. The Gemara talks about the bracha Hatova Hametiv. Shachianu v'kimanu v'giyanu l'azmanazah. You thank, thank God for getting us to a certain moment. And then there's a bracha Hatova Hametiv, which is actually the Opposite of Diana and Met, opposite bracha, the opposite of the bracha that we say, God forbid, when someone passes away. Hatova Metiv, on good, he who, who brings good, or on good and Metiv and brings good to others. So the question is, when do you make Hatova Metiv? And what's the difference between Hatova Metiv and Shachiana? It's a fair question, right? I mean, they both seem to be brachas when good things happen, when new things happen. Um, and Sharon asked me, do you make a bracha when you, when you have the shot? I couldn't reach my father. It was nighttime in Israel. He was sleeping. And I found myself in the same situation at six o'clock. I, and it was, it was, it was probably more emotional for me because I showed up at Mount Sinai on the east side. There were 3000 people online. So I knew I wasn't going to get it. So I Ubered over the west side and I begged. I said, all those teachers that you vaccinated, I'm their principal. Um, and I need that shot. And I, I got on standby. I was like literally waiting on standby for a flight. And they said, if you wait here till seven o'clock, 
We'll see what we can do. And they gave me the last dose of the evening because they're all metered out. And I found myself instinctively um, making that bracha. I just made it. I didn't. I didn't have time to ask, and I made the bracha because it felt. It felt right. The Gemara says you, you have a new bottle of wine. If a new bottle of wine, now I like to drink a bottle, new bottle of wine too. But if you can make a bracha of atov on a new bottle of wine, so certainly that injection, which is going to help the move the, the world move forward, um, should warrant that bracha. So I just told my father. Actually, I told him over the weekend. I said, "Listen, I didn't have time to ask you. I hope it's okay. I made the bracha, even though I couldn't. I didn't have time to ask you the question." And I was looking around this morning a little bit to understand that difference between the bracha of Shechiano and the bracha of Tov Amitiv. And the Gemara says an interesting thing. The Gemara says that, um, yes, that, that would be a Kavachomer, I agree. So the Gemara says that <laughs> my father told me, it's, my, this is my father, once I did it, my father says, oh, Benny, you're right. Of course you're right. Of course, you're right. If I would have asked him before, he might have told me something else. But once I did it, he's not going to tell me I was wrong. So that's what happened. So the Gemara says that the difference between Shachianu and Atova Ametiv is that Shachianu is for yourself and Atova Ametiv is for others. In other words, if something happens to you, for you personally or privately, then the appropriate bracha is Shachianu. And if something happens that's a public thing or that's a communal thing, then that bracha is Atova Ametiv. Now we can ask a lot of questions about that because the holidays then. I don't seem so. Well, there are lots of questions on that, but there is an interesting explanation that's given by I think it's the Chay Adam, who says that when a poor person gets a new beggar, when someone gives a poor person a new piece of clothing, then he doesn't make a shachiyanu, even though it's personal, but he makes a hatov hamit, which is supposed to be communal. So the question is why? That's pers- totally personally. Somebody gave me a new piece of clothing, and the reason that the the Chay Adam gives to explain this halacha is that when a poor person gets a new piece of clothing, it's obviously a simcha for him, but actually it's a simcha for the person that gave it to him. Actually, the reason why you can say hatov hametiv is because it's the joy is both ways. The joy of giving is almost equal to the joy of, of receiving. And therefore, he says hatov hametiv is the appropriate bracha because it's good for the world. It's not just good for him. It's good for the giver. It's not just good for him. So I was thinking about that. Why the, the bracha that people are batting around now for this vaccine is Hatova Hametiv. And it's so, it's an amazing thing, right? We've been talking about that for so many months, how this is not just about you. The, the restrictions that we put on ourselves are not just about protecting ourselves from getting sick, but everything has been kind of outward looking. Almost so many, so many of the things that we're doing at school are to protect the people at home, are to protect the, the vulnerable people at home, are to protect the older people at home, right? And the same thing with the vaccine, which is that, of course, it's something that is going to hopefully make us healthy and healthier. And at the same time, it's going to make the world um, a better place. It was one of the more powerful brachot that I've had the opportunity to make in my lifetime. Um, and again, uh, if you want to uh, follow that lead, if you haven't gotten, you can do it on your second dose too. To me, it's a it's a meaningful thing to do. Again, I'm not uh, I'm not your postake, but uh, I, I would think that you should consider it because certainly it feels like a a watershed moment in the uh, in the in the ten months um, that we've been experiencing. I keep on saying ten. We're going on eleven and twelve, and um, and we're not done yet. I wanted to share a few thoughts, and then I'll introduce Dr. Barzeb, who's going to come in a couple of minutes. Um, because I was thinking about what the um, what the the whole experience meant to me generally. First of all, it's been a year. Talking about my parents, um, it's been a year since I saw my parents. I think last February fifteenth, when I was in Israel at the end of the last vacation. I don't think in my fifty years, and I lived in different countries. I lived in Europe for six years. I lived in Israel for a couple of years. I don't think I've ever ever gone probably three months without without seeing my parents. Um, and I know that that's an experience that, that that so many of us have in terms of being separated from people who are close to us. We're separated by borders. We're separated by restrictions. We lost a year in that way. Um, and technology is great. And that's been a silver lining, so to speak, but it's not the same. And I also know, thank you, Mendel. Nice to know that you visited them. I know that you did because you fixed my mother's uh, something, camera, something like that. She says it's not totally fixed. She still needs help. Whatever. But I told her, it's like, okay, this is a long process. We'll, we'll do that some other time. But um, um, thank you, Mendel. Um, like, that's a big deal. And I think that we're seeing the, we're seeing the 
I hope I hope the next stage of that and being reunited with people that are close with us. I also know that that's not true for everyone. I know that there are people who are not going to be reunited and people in this world who are not going to be reunited. And that's a really, really hard way. Um, that's a really, really hard way um, to to separate. Um, and that's and that's that's sad and that's hard. I mean, you got to keep that in mind. So I'm very, very excited. Uh, looking forward, God willing, to seeing my parents. It's going to be a full year by the time I see them. But recognizing recognizing the loss of those of those ten to twelve months is something that 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 humbles us. Um, I'm sharing the thoughts that I wrote down. I'll I'll write this somewhere, and I'm just you know I wanted, I wanted to like. Uh, um share it with you first um i've never and you know, i say this all the time now to kids because it means a lot to me what we do matters i've learned over the last 10 months more than any ever else, any other time that i've experienced is that the things that we do matter the words that we use matter the things that we say matter the ideas that we bring to life matter i read this article about the people that you know pfizer you talk about pfizer billion dollar company there's a couple in cologne cologne is a place that means something to me because i when i lived in germany we, we we made a school there and there's a husband and wife in cologne who ride their bicycles to work who actually developed this vaccine scientists who actually developed this pfizer vaccine imagine that you go to work and you sit in the lab and you're doing stuff and you wow you just made it what, what kind of difference can people can people make we started this volunteers WhatsApp. It's an amazing thing. And some of you know this firsthand. We put 15, I don't know what the number is, 15, 20 people on a WhatsApp. And all they're doing all day is finding sites and then helping people who can't get, get there fast enough to sign up and make appointments for those vaccines. It's a game-changing thing because people can share their knowledge and can share their talents and their abilities to do something with other people. Um, and there are so many examples of this. We just had a dinner celebrating so many of these people. The things that we do matter. Um, and I think we have to remember that. I think we, 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 we have to remember that as we hopefully go to the next stage. And I think it's an important thing to, to, to realize, wow, we can make a difference in the world. Kids, adults, scientists, teachers, the things that we do make a difference. I think we also learned, I learned this powerfully again last weekend from you how much we need each other. There's nothing, there's no, no top-down approach that would have done what you guys did in that Slack channel over the last weekend. And by the way, now you know it. Now those appointments can't be had. Hopefully they'll come back. Hopefully you'll find them, the people will find them again. But just putting something out there and saying, okay, share the information with you. It was, my, when I got my vaccine, it was the first day it was legal. 1B, it was the first day. How many people got their vaccines on the first day? I think the number is, Yael told me this morning, 140 people so far have already received their vaccines. And how many others are scheduled? It's amazing what happens when you can collaborate with people to, uh, to get things done. And that's, and that's a big deal. I want to say this again because it's true. You know, I think that we all have the 150 plus, the IL says now. I think that we all experience the world through the, through the lens of our own experience. We all see the world through the lens of our own experience. So I think that for me, all I've been thinking about the last week is, okay, now that we're vaccinated or now that we're almost immune or now that we're almost done with our vaccinations, and the truth is, and I know this well, and you all know this well, we're, you know, we people talk about the 2%. We're the 2%. It's the 2%, 2% of the community. That's it. 98% of the community aren't and won't be and actually don't know how long it will be before they are. And we have to remember that. So as, as happy as we are for the fact that this is moving in the right direction and as grateful as we are for the fact that we, um, that we're, we're part of a group that's been recognized. And by the way, having teachers being recognized for, for, for the heroes that you are is a big thing in society. And I think that um, that's been a long time in coming. So I feel very, very good about that. It's also important for us to be humble and for us to remember um, that most people aren't here. Most people aren't there yet. Most people are, are still waiting and don't, don't even exactly know, you know when that time, whether it will be a month or two months or six months. I do hope the supply will get better. I do hope that the systems will get better. I do hope that, that they'll, you know, they'll figure this out. We're, we're approaching a million a day in this country and hopefully if that can go to two million, it will move, it will move a lot faster. Um, but we have to remember that. So what we're experiencing 
what I'm experiencing is what most people are not is is not what most people are experiencing, and that has to be a source of humility, um, a source of humility as well. And then I think, and then I think there's time to reflect, which we'll do, and I'm not going to do it now on the things that we've learned from these 10 months, the things that the, our connection to families that we've had over these 10 months, which have been different, things that we want to keep in school that we've learned over these 10 months, right? The world isn't just a static place. We don't just have experiences and then go right back to where we were before, but we learn from those things. And we're going to we're gonna spend some time in this context around, you know, with each other talking about what that means for school. I had a fabulous, positive, positive meeting with the teachers committee um, about what post-pandemic school can look like through the lens of what we learned over the last 10 months. There's a lot there, and, and it was reinforced to me from your colleagues um, on the committee and from other conversations that I'm having. And I think I, I'm really excited to have those conversations starting in a couple of weeks um, and over the next couple of months as we're planning for next year. Um, so taking the lessons that we learned about family, about community, about education, about children, about resilience, so many things that we have to learn um, and being able to um, to to make ourselves better, make our community better, make our school better and stronger through the things that we learn, um, I think is a, is a really important, is a really important thing. Um, somebody asked me about people who are hesitating about the vaccination. Actually, that's one of the reasons why Dr. Barzev is going to be coming on. I wanted to speak to anybody here um, and also people who are not here. We'll try to include in conversations about, um, about hesitations that people have around the vaccine, which is which is fair. I think that it's important to be educated and it's important to help other people get educated. And please, please, let's do that. I've been, you know, I've been making some people uncomfortable, which is okay, I guess, um, walking around kind of asking people when their appointment is or if they're vaccinated yet. And a couple of people have looked at me like, I'm not sure I'm ready for that yet. So I hope, hopefully that we can, you know, make sure that you have the information that you need and the encouragement that you need to, uh, uh, to get there. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have that in a couple of minutes with our, with our guest. Very quickly, um, in terms of our vacation planning, we're going we're gonna to send something out. I know that people are trying to figure out their plans. We're going to do the testing, it looks like, um, after the um, vacation like we did last time. We will maybe I have to we have to make that decision today I think there's a good chance I would say that we'll have one zoom day please don't take me take my word for it right now um, but there might be one zoom day after that in order for the testing to come back in order for people who are traveling to have their four days before the testing so that's on the table I have to discuss it with the high school and we have to make a decision um, but that is something that we are strongly considering it worked out well last time um, and again, we're not at the end of the tunnel yet, so we're going to have to make sure that we're that we're in a good place. I'm happy, you know, I know that there's a group in quarantine now, but obviously the numbers since we came back from vacation have certainly been better than before the vacation, even though the numbers outside um, are not particularly uh, good. I'm going to ask, and again, I'm not going to do, I don't want to, I don't want to delay our speaker, but, um, you know, we had some questions around Zooming from home post vacation, Zooming from home right generally. I'd like to basically kind of appeal to everyone's Flexibility, um, which means on the parent side, which means they have to understand that if you're Zooming from home, it might not be perfect. And on the teacher side, it means that, yeah, we're going to try to open it up. People want to Zoom from home and it's not crazy. I'm not talking about somebody who's spending four weeks, you know, in Florida or skiing or something like that. And they just want to Zoom from there and it makes it really hard for us. Those are, those are you know, kind of case by case things that we can deal with. Um, and we can, you know, we, with, with your administrators, we can manage that. But I, what I would like to ask for is that the basic default is, yeah, if somebody wants to Zoom, that we try to be, we try to be reasonable about, um, I see that Dr. Barzev is in, if we could let him in and I'll introduce him one second. Um, if we can be reasonable about that, um, if we, Dr. Barzev, welcome. I'm going to, I'm going to formally introduce you in one second. Thank you so much. If we can be reasonable about that, I think that would be best for everyone. These people are, are asking to zoom in from home because they have reasons and we don't have to let's stay away from the judgments about whether, OK, they, they could have come home three days earlier. Let's try. Let's try. I'm going to I'm going to tell them I'm going to support you on that, um, that they have to be reasonable with us. It might not be perfect. And at the same time, if that's what if that's what the world is about for the next couple of months still, then we're going to try to uh, we're going to try to make that work. So please uh, let's keep that in mind. I know that that wasn't exactly like a clarity of of what the rules are, but that's OK. I can live with that. If, we, if you can, um, I can, too. So let's try to um, let's try to do that. Dr. Barzev, how are you? Hi, hi everyone. Hi. I'll, 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 I'll share with you that I, I texted Dr. Brazil about three o'clock in the afternoon yesterday. I said, can you speak to teachers? And he said, yes. 
Um, and that's pretty much it. You're getting, you're very, very busy. You're getting these requests all the time. I know you spoke to our high schoolers, which was very well um, received. And I really, really appreciate you giving us a few minutes of your time. And I actually saw on the, on the clip that you sent me, um, somebody had a, um, somebody had a, we can cut it, Hi, don't worry about it. Um, we, you introduced yourself because you, you you did that beautifully and better than I could do. I actually spoke about you before and I said, it's been it's been uh, as good to get to know you. I know that you're a new parent here and we haven't met, we haven't met even in person, but we've uh, we've interacted a little bit and uh, it's really an honor to have you as part of the community. And first of all, to you and the work that you're doing to to make the world a safer place is something that we deeply deeply appreciate and um, happy to to learn from you. So if I can ask you to introduce yourself, then maybe we'll have a little bit of a conversation and allow for some questions from the chat. Um, and then uh, go as long as you got as long as you have till your uh, till your next appointment or uh, till we uh, whatever you'll you'll tell me how much patience you have, um, and we'll take it from there. So thank you very very much for uh, for taking the time. No worries. Sure, sure, no worries. Can you hear me? Okay. Perfect. Perfect. First okay, of all, how are you so kids doing? Cool. Yeah, they're good. Everyone is good. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, we haven't met in person. That, that's very 2019 meeting in person, of course, but um, <laughs> yeah. it would be good if that could come back again in fashion. Um, oh, so hello, everybody. My, my name is Or. I'm a pediatrician and infectious disease specialist and um, epidemiologist and a few other things. But um, my, um, my area of work is around vaccine uh, deployment and vaccine evaluation. Um, and I've been doing that for a pretty long time um, in different places around the world. Um, and obviously in the last year um, or so, pretty much all of my work has shifted. Well, not all, but most of my work has shifted to um, work on coronavirus um, vaccines, um, evaluating um, the trials that have been uh, published uh, or prior to them beginning published. Um, reviewing deployment strategies, um, advising countries on um, appropriate decisions and preparedness and all that kind of thing. Um, I also do some work for the World Health Organization providing scientific oversight um, for um, both policy documents and, and peer-reviewed papers and so on come, coming out of there. Um, my, I've got a, uh, I hold a position, a faculty position at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore um, and I'm Deputy Director of um, the International Vaccine Access Centre there. We work mainly on making um, vaccines available to countries that otherwise um, would have difficulty affording it or, or, or so on. So that's what I do. Um, so there's obviously a huge amount that we could cover, but I, I'd rather be, I guess, directed by your questions and maybe they could come up through the chat if you want. But um, I'll address my uh, remarks very quickly, perhaps, um, just to say the following a few comments. Um, I hesitate to use the word unprecedented because it's been used an unprecedented number of times in the last few months. Um, but, you know, we are in an unusual situation where we've had um, a pandemic that occurs, uh, you know, roughly in the order of one in a hundred years or, or, or less. Um, thankfully, not an extremely um, terrible one. I know it's, it has been terrible and, and perhaps the response to the, the risk, let me just plug in one second. <clears throat> perhaps in, in part, not just the virus, but the response to the virus has at times perhaps been not perfectly balanced or, or, or thoughtful and there'd be different views on that and they're all very valid views. But certainly in terms of the pandemic itself, a highly infectious pandemic, thankfully not an extremely deadly pandemic, um, certainly not compared to previous coronavirus large scale international epidemics like the MERS coronavirus um, epidemic, which occurred in 2012 case fatality, uh, which would have been, um, you know, probably initially um, skewed upwards, but nevertheless, um, was a case fatality of about 35%. Uh, we're very, very fortunate that we don't have a coronavirus like that with the infectivity that we have currently, and that kind of mortality, that would be a, you know, a tremendous event if that was to happen, akin to, you know, the Black Plague in Europe and stuff in the 1300s. So we're nowhere like that. Um, nevertheless, we have a highly agent that um, has done a very efficient job, thank you very much, infecting the entire globe pretty quickly and is taking a toll uh, in older adults, is taking a toll in um, persons that have other medical conditions, including obesity, which is you know, very common, um, and indeed also taking, um, although in relative terms, a much lesser toll, but still uh, is occurring because of the magnitude of the outbreak 
is also taking its toll in younger adults. Um, and uh, uh, you know, and obviously the saving grace of this whole thing is that children are relatively spared, you know, notwithstanding the issues of the infl systemic inflammatory response thing that we have heard about, that's extremely rare. Um, so, you know, this is a, a major global pandemic. Within a, a short span of time, relatively speaking, we've been able to produce an array of different vaccines to help mitigate the uh, effect of this pandemic in a much, in short order, really, much quicker than has been the case in the past. So I might address my comments briefly about how that happened, how we were able to get to where we are quickly, and what does that mean? Um, the normal process of um, developing a vaccine is that companies uh, put in an effort on the assumption that they will have a product at the end that they can sell. That's just the reality of things. Um, they have to invest money to make, um, uh, to run trials, to develop, to do all the preclinical studies, the animal studies, the bench studies, and then eventually the human studies. All of that takes uh, time and effort. Then once they have a product that they think has clinical efficacy, that means that it reduces some kind of outcome uh, in humans that is of relevance clinically, for example, a disease then they would go to the FDA or other, other body around the world and they would seek licensure. Um, if their data are not good enough or if the trial design wasn't well thought through or things like that, they can be sent packing back to the drawing board. Obviously, in the um, context of a pandemic, we can't afford to have everybody go back to the drawing board. So the FDA and other licensing authorities around the world um, got together in, the, in, and in, the, in that regard, really in uh, you know, an exemplary way sharing protocols, sharing data, sharing available uh, evidence um, and said, do the trials this way. We're going to have a combined data safety monitoring board across all trials. The Pfizer wasn't part of that, but the, for the other trials. That way, if we have rare events emerging in this trial and a rare event emerging in that trial, we'll see it all at the same time so it will emerge more quickly um, and conduct the trials in that way. So that's what was done. And huge investment was put into it, you know, literally billions of dollars, uh, billions of dollars into these companies so that the trials that they conducted were very large, much larger than they would otherwise normally be for any therapeutic that goes onto the market and achieves licensure. Usually that's, you know, much smaller trials. Now, these were in very large trials. Um, and sadly, because COVID is such a common disease, it was very easy and quick to accrue cases of COVID. And so when you're randomizing people, volunteers, into a placebo arm and into a vaccine arm, it doesn't take very long before, before you start to see the accrual of cases in the two arms. And obviously the assumption is that if the vaccine is working then you would see the accrual of cases occurring less quickly in the vaccinated arm and more quickly in the placebo arm. And that's in fact how you determine efficacy in the trial. Um, so all of that happened. Um, in addition, um, we've uh, been following up uh, the safety outcomes in those trials. And we know quite a lot now about um, the fact that these are very unpleasant vaccines compared to the usual types of vaccines that are given. They, these are vaccines, they're both the, both the mRNA vaccines and also the adenovirus vector vaccine, which is the AstraZeneca one, not yet available in the US, may not be, are much more reactogenic. They cause much more local side effects and systemic side effects for that matter. Um, that, you know, they're mild to moderate. And if you've got fever for two, two, three days and muscle aches and crampy arm, that's not so pleasant. And it's more than not pleasant, um, but they wane, they go away those um, symptoms after about two, three days. The key issue, there are two key issues that are still unknown. And also I can see lots of questions coming, so I'll take a look at them in a second. There are two key issues that remain relatively still unknown. Um, the first are, uh, well, three, let's call them three different issues. The first is the longevity of the um, effect. Uh, how long will protection last from these vaccines? We don't know because we haven't had enough time, um, but the trials are supposed to be continuing out to about two years. There are ethical challenges in continuing a trial when you have an, a licensed vaccine. And if I'm in a placebo arm, how am I going to be continued on placebo when there's a vaccine available? So there, there are challenges in in that and ways around those issues. But nevertheless, the trials are supposed to be following out for two years and we will see whether or not protection wanes over time. Um, the second is in terms of safety outcomes, we know a lot about the uh, short-term safety outcomes up to about five months, but we clearly want to know uh, things for a longer duration than that. Um, it should be said that whatever things we will be observing uh, from now on are likely to be relatively rare outcomes. 
and when you're weighing up the safety of the vaccine, you have to weigh, um, you know, the risk of the vaccine, I should say. You need to weigh that up against the risk of not being vaccinated also. There are two risks in any uncertain decision, the risk of, the, of action and the risk of non-action. And so long as COVID disease is prevalent and, um, and uh, spreading quickly and likely to cause severe outcomes in groups, certain groups, then those uh, risk benefit balance has to be weighed up uh, you know, rationally on both sides. So safety is an issue, but rare events will occur um, and rare events that will be serious will occur um, and maybe even deaths uh, will occur and in fact probably have occurred, but they have to be taken in context of the risk from COVID and they also have to be taken in the context of the background rate of those events. So let's just give you an example. If, um, if I take the normal death rate for elderly adults in the UK, for example, 0.03 percent, for example, in, in, in any two-week period, if I vaccinate a million people, just even if I don't, if I just click my fingers and I, I see how many people die after that, if I out of a million people, maybe 30,000 deaths will occur in the next two weeks. So if I give everybody a vaccine and there's 30,000 deaths occur within two weeks of receiving a vaccine, it's really important we understand. Uh, to be able, but that we're able to differentiate what's causal, what, what, is, what are the deaths, excessive deaths that are caused by the vaccine, and what are deaths that would have occurred had there not been the vaccine there. That, that requires very diligent, very careful, um, very studious, and very honest epidemiology. Um, so that will be required, particularly because the vaccine has been given to vulnerable groups. Okay, so I spoke about um, the longevity of the effect, I spoke about uh, adverse events, and the third thing that I said that we don't really know very much about. That third thing is really whether the vaccine will, uh, will um, induce protection, not against the disease, but against the infection. So by that I mean that you can be infected with the, with the organism and potentially uh, not have any symptoms from that. Okay? And we know that that's actually a common, relatively common feature with coronavirus, and it's the SARS-2 coronavirus, that people can have asymptomatic infection, but they can still be transmitting. Why is that important? Well, it's important because if I give a vaccine that reduces disease but doesn't reduce transmission, and everybody thinks, well, whoopee, I've been vaccinated, I can now take off my mask and I can go back and congregate, um, then transmission paradoxically will go up. Well, paradoxically, it'll go up. Um, and if uh, not all groups that are vulnerable or high risk have received the vaccine or are um, accepting of the vaccine or they're worried about the vaccine, or whatever it is, or that it doesn't work as well in the elderly, for example, which at least thankfully we know the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines do seem to work well in the elderly. Um, but had they not, or had, had, if there are groups that don't receive the vaccine and our risk and transmission is increasing, um, then paradoxically you can see an increase in deaths and so on. So it's really important to know whether the vaccine reduces transmission or not, because this whole concept of herd protection and the reduction of um, of the incidence of disease will only occur with, if the vaccine reduces transmission. Um, it will not occur if the vaccine reduces disease. And if a vaccine reduces disease, it will be extra important to make sure that everybody who's at risk gets it first before we start giving it to other groups for the sake of transmission reduction. There wouldn't be as much point in doing that if the vaccine doesn't do that. So from the animal models that we know, the animal studies, we know that there is some reduction in transmission. Um, and uh, but we haven't yet seen the human data on that for the mRNA vaccines. The AstraZeneca vaccine, which is an adenovirus effective vaccine, we do have some information and it's relatively disappointing. It's that it doesn't seem to have done a great deal for transmission. There are a whole, um, there's a whole body of work going into this and looking at this, a commission through WHO and, and CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Invasions, and they're the ones that you know, it, it pushed for. Uh, or encourage the development of all of these vaccines. Um, so there's a lot of work going into that, but at the moment it remains uncertain. Um, and that's okay because this is science in real time. We're seeing all of this evolving. Uh, scientists don't know anything in advance. Uh, and we're not, we don't claim to. And we're learning like everybody's learning, but we're just doing it very methodically and, and hoping to get to the important answers as quickly as possible. Um, and so that's where we are. Um, that's it really. So, so that what we do know about the vaccine, sorry, is that you know, it's much more effective than we had hoped or efficacious than we had hoped at reducing disease. And so it will be really important to be taken by uh, groups who are at risk and probably groups who don't perceive themselves to be at risk, but they still are at greater risk of COVID than they are from vaccine um, 
Um, I'll stop there and then maybe I'll look at some of the questions. Yeah, if, if maybe I can kind of help moderate that for you and, you know, sure. try to get some, some themes. So, for again, obviously you, you've just addressed this, but maybe directly. So what, what what's your what's your 60 second message out there to a healthy 55 year old who is nervous about this and would rather wait six months? Uh, what's 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 the argument? Or what's the, um, or not well, the argument? What's the, what's the message? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, people should go and be vaccinated, um, clearly. The, the, the reason is that the COVID is still very prevalent. We're at worst levels of COVID than we've been. Um, and it's causing fatality and it's causing morbidity and it's causing it in people who are certainly people who are above 55, 65 and so on. As you go down in age, obviously, the relative fatality is, is, is in relative terms less, but it's still a major uh, absolute cause of uh, issues because it's so prevalent. Um, we are confident in the safety of this, these vaccines that are available. Uh, and when you're, and we don't know everything, but we never know everything. But what, when you're balancing the two risks, the risks of COVID versus the risks of the vaccine, the decision is relatively straightforward. It's clear. Obviously, that decision or that balance of risk differs for different groups. If I'm 85 or 75, there's zero query question at all. Like it's clear that the benefit of the vaccine outweighs the, um, the harm potentially. But in younger groups, it's a valid question because you always have to weigh up risks and benefits and they differ in different populations. But the message is that even in younger age groups, the benefit uh, is still in favor of vaccination and people should uh, go out and be vaccinated. Um, and it's not gonna be easy to get a vaccine for a while yet, but we should avail ourselves of it if it becomes available. <laughs> Anybody who should have who should have questions, pregnant women, or or again, I don't know if you want a paskin, so to speak, but uh, any any situations where you would say, you know what, you should speak to somebody before you do it. So whenever you have a personal query about your personal situation, then of course you should speak to your physician. I'm speaking in general terms, in public health terms, in policy terms, and so on. Uh, but the following information about pregnancy: pregnant women were excluded from the clinical trials. That's normal because we uh, those clinical trials were not only looking at efficacy, they were looking at safety. They were designed to look to pick up safety signals. And so it's normal that we take risks with volunteers. People volunteer, they're aware that they could, they're taking a risk and they're potentially also being protected. Um, but we don't include pregnant women in the regional run of trials in most cases, there's some exceptions. Um, and we do that because we want to, first of all, establish safety. Once we've established safety in healthy, normal, and normal, I mean non-pregnant, even though pregnancy is normal, uh, you know, non-pregnant individuals, then we say, okay, well, we're taking a risk now also with pregnant women and their unborn children. And in fact, that's happening now. So Pfizer is now recruiting, we're going to get to do that, I think, but Pfizer is now recruiting in, in pregnancy. Um, and we feel confident now to do that because of the safety da data that we have so far. Uh, and we'll see. We also have good safety data from animal studies and our pregnant animals, specifically recruited pregnant animals, uh, volunteer animals. Uh, and they were, um, and nothing happened. There was no no risk to that. Now, COVID itself um, is not as bad as influenza on pregnancy, for example, but it does cause an increased risk to pregnant women compared to non-pregnant women, um, and uh, and also to the pregnancy itself. And so, uh, the question is, what should we do at the moment? And the balancing of risks and benefits at the moment is likely to be in favour of vaccinating uh, pregnant women. And so, pregnant women are told if you're in a group that is eligible to receive the vaccine, you can go ahead and receive the vaccine. But Certainly feel free to ask specific questions. There are many, many individual circumstances that, that public uh, pronouncements don't necessarily uh, fit. And uh, in all such cases, you should definitely get personal advice. Got it. Oh, thank you. Uh, there was an article in the Times this morning, and this is probably the question that you get asked most and, you know, is, is, is being bad around. Um, so, cause so you've been vaccinated, let's say you're after your second dose, 14 days after your second dose. And then there's, as you just said, they're saying, okay, you could possibly still transmit the virus. You know, I think the point of the times article that I understood was kind of like, okay, obviously that's something that's still being studied. Um, but the chances of that are X and I don't certainly want to put numbers in there. So, so is this a question of time? In other words, okay, right now we can't tell you to do more than, you know, to change much of your behavior because you might transmit the virus, but hopefully with time we will find out that that's not really the case. How about if both parties are vaccinated? Would that change the way you can behave? 
like you know i think you know for some people i think that they're feeling like okay we're getting this vaccination that we're telling we're saying nothing changes and that you know again you're not a psychologist but this is you know it's a little bit of a downer it's kind of like okay so what 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 has this done for us so to speak so if you can address that a little bit in terms of where you think we would be two weeks after the vaccine or maybe three months from now two weeks after the vaccine with more information um, well, I can answer that at two levels. At the individual level, um, you know, it's it, it it's likely that there will be some protection against infection and transmission. But at this stage, it looks likely that that degree of protection will be less than the protection against disease. Okay, so if the vaccines in the trials were ninety five percent efficacious against uh, against symptomatic COVID. It doesn't mean that they won't be efficacious against asymptomatic infection, but they could be less efficacious against asymptomatic infection. Now, how less, we don't know. Is it 75%? That's still a pretty good you know, odds. Is it 50%? Is it 6%? We don't yet know that information. Um, so in the interim, like was before, yes, we should continue to consider ourselves potentially infectious to others and, and balance those against, you know, the people with whom we have contact. If we're going to visit Boba and Zayda and, and you know, Boba's recovering from, you know, breast cancer chemotherapy or whatever, then we need to be extra careful and not just take it easy because we've been vaccinated. But if we're visiting people who are at low risk in and of themselves, then perhaps that, that calculation can be different. So the vaccine will contribute to our, to our uh, emergence from this pandemic but on its own at this stage it's insufficient that's at the individual level at a population level there will be a major difference the key purpose of vaccinating the population is not so that we don't have masks it's not so that we can go back to class it's so that we don't have deaths and so if we can get the vaccine out there to enough people who are vulnerable and to sufficiently vaccinate the elderly and people with comorbidities and communities of color and other groups that have been at high risk of fatality then we will see a major reduction in deaths and hopefully a major reduction in hospitalizations. Once we see that, even if we're still all wearing our masks, we can take a big sigh of relief into our mask and then we can reevaluate where we're at. But I think, first of all, we have to see a reduction in mortality and morbidity. Once we can see a mortality and morbidity reduction, then even if we can, by reducing masks, we increase the risk of transmission well, we, at least we know that we have the capacity to cope with that. And at least we know that we've achieved a, a major issue here, which is the reduction in mortality and, and morbidity. There will still be this residual question at, but at then, at what point is it appropriate to stop with all of these other things? And we're not there yet, but we will be, we will be. And the way we're gonna get there is with vaccination and maybe with second generation vaccines. In other words, maybe there are, we're going to continue to have to work on vaccines that reduce infection as well as disease, but I wouldn't wait for those vaccines before we roll out these ones, because the whole point is to reduce the death rate. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so yeah. that, so the fact that, you know, for us, it's still a frustration or annoyance, or we can't have people over for Shabbos lunch, you know, and I'm not minimizing the huge impact that this has had, um, but the key issue is to reduce deaths. Once we can do that, then perhaps we can reopen the economy, even with masks, you know, that that's the critical issue, services and availability of of normal uh, economic activity, which has hit families and children and, and everybody so hard, and itself has a toll on morbidity, mortality, and suicide rates, and domestic violence, and many other uh, harms that come to humanity from the response to the vaccine. Uh, and getting that balance right has been so difficult. Maybe that can be eased uh, even while we're still wearing masks. And once we emerge slowly from all of those things, then we can finally say, yep. okay, life is a bit more normal. Mm -hmm. And a direct question. So vaccinated, my, I'm vaccinated and my parents are vaccinated. Can we see each other with no restrictions, some restrictions, all restrictions? The current, re the current recommendation officially is that it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not, you need to continue with wearing masks and social distancing. The reality of individual decision making, how much you're willing to be makeal on those things, how lenient you're willing to be on those things depends on your personal circumstances. Yep. You know, if your if your if your mother is an elderly lady, you need to be more careful. If, on the other hand, your mother really needs help in the house, and you're the only one that can give it to her, then you know, right. you've got to weigh up the individual realities of people. But the general principle behind the thinking, the starting point is: for now, things are continuing unchanged in terms of masks and distancing. And even if both parties are got it, okay, correct, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Um, children, tell me where where we are now with children and where you think we'll be: 16, sure. 18, 14. D 
just the one other small point about that previous question. 95% efficacious is very high, but it still means one in 20 can get sick. Yeah. Okay. So just yeah. remembering that. And so it's a question of who are you talking about? Somebody who otherwise probably will get mild illness. Okay, fine. But if somebody's a high risk, they have to be, you have to weigh that up. Children, we don't know anything yet about a vaccine uh, in children. The, the, um, the, the um, Pfizer vaccine was evaluated in uh, people down to the age of 16. Um, one of the Indian kill vaccines uh, is, that means an, a, a, an inactivated vaccine was evaluated in children down to the age of 12. Currently, Moderna and Pfizer are recruiting children down to the age of 12. Once they do that, they'll be recruiting probably children down to the age of five. Whether they'll recruit children below that age is not yet known. Um, the key issue there is really about safety, um, and we're going to be looking at safety outcomes in those uh, children. Again, that's a normal sequence of events that we first look at healthy adults, and only then we look at children and their ethical reasons for that and other reasons for that. Um, once we know that, then presumably there will be emergency use authorization will be broadened to include those groups if it's safe. Um, but it, it doesn't, they're not a priority group. They're not a priority group because they themselves are uh, at low risk of severe disease. They may be prioritized if we knew that the vaccines reduce transmission and there would be a reason to argue perhaps to vaccinate children for the, you know, the sake of transmission reduction, but older children, not so much younger children. But the reality is at the moment that neither are younger children very major transmitters, nor do the vaccines necessarily, are not, nor are they known to definitely reduce transmission. So all of that deprioritizes children. In a congregate setting like a school, the focus should be on vaccinating teachers and protecting the teachers themselves and the whole pod system and all the bubble system and all that will unfortunately need to continue for a while as transmission reduction. We can't rely on the vaccine for that just yet, but we certainly should be um, giving to teachers. And I read the New York um, current phase, I think from January 11th did include teachers. So they're yes. not gonna be easy to get, but, uh, but officially they're eligible. So they now here we have about 180 people on this call and I think 140 of them have received their first dose. So, so they got it early and that, that's, that's where this, that's where this group is right now. Um, uh, oh shoot, I can't remember what I was about to ask you. Uh, Do you think it's worthwhile with the vaccine show? Oh, sorry. Oh, let me go back. I don't know how much you deal with supply and distribution. Um, you know, we've been hearing this on, on different sites, but do you have, are you hopeful that it's, that's going to get better? Is it distribution problem, supply problem? The city says it's a supply problem. They blame it on the state. The state blames it on the federal government. But <laughs> tell me where you think we are from your perspective. Yep, yeah, sure. So you're breaking up a bit uh, with the audio. So I, I, I think the question is relating to supply and, and um, procurement. Um, I mean, this was a foreseeable issue. I mean, I, I published about this, you know, I don't know, five months ago, six months ago, whenever it was, to, to say we have to plan for it because it's going to be an issue. Um, again, this is another one of the areas that is you know, unprecedented in scale and magnitude. And um, normally we produce 300 uh, million doses a year of vaccine for the world birth cohort. And now you're talking, you know, in the billions. Um, so, this is no factory, no single company, no, no, you know, nobody can do that. Now, having said that, the part of the Operation Warp Speed funding went into scale up manufacturing, and manufacturing is being scaled up. Pfizer is, is announcing that they're changing the, the nature of their manufacturing procedures in order to increase volume. Many other companies are doing uh, the same. There will be companies in other parts of the world also that have the capacity to scale up manufacture. Once you scale up manufacture, then you can. You also need to obviously have infrastructure for delivery, and it has to be delivered under a very ultra cold chain and all of that stuff. And then you have to make available points for distribution. Who's going to be distributing? Who's going to be vaccinating? How are you going to do it in a way that's safe and doesn't cause people to congregate? How do you reach the elderly and so on? Um, we had now an opportunity with the flu vaccine this this winter now to try up, um, different mechanisms for reaching older adults with flu vaccine as a kind of a dress rehearsal really for a COVID vaccine and, and there are lessons learned from that in many jurisdictions. Um, and so big efforts are gonna be made to make that ha happen. But it, you know, Israel is a small country. Israel has Kupot Cholim, uh, you know, HMOs. Israel, everybody is uh, registered uh, and their medical record is electronic. Um, Israel is geographically small. Israel has is very good at logistics and you know militarizing logistics and stuff, so they did very well. Uh, but they were always going to do well. It's kind of you know not a surprise that they did well. The United States is a big giant of a country, 
with multi, each state is is a country unto itself, um, and with huge complex uh, health system, you know, and, and, and peripheralized responsibility for a lot of that stuff at the moment. So um, it's a challenge, and it will continue to be a challenge for some months. Um, but we'll get over it, and we'll, we'll eventually get there. But it'll take a long time, and as it will in other countries. Um, right. People, some people on this call are worried about not getting their second appointment. Second appointments being cancelled. Hopefully, that won't happen. But what would you say to people in terms of how they should approach that in terms in their heads? <laughs> how nervous I they should be. I think it's likely that. I think whether or not there's this, you know, there's this idea being floated around of delaying the second dose, giving everybody as many people as possible the first dose, um, and then going to the second dose. That's being discussed at the policy level. The FDA has um, come out um, cautiously against that. Um, you know, the, Uni the United Kingdom is taking that approach because the data from AstraZeneca vaccine is a little bit more in favor of doing that. There are not really much data from the Pfizer vaccine on doing that. In principle, it makes some sense to delay the second dose because the longer you delay before you give your second dose, usually the more the more um, robust the response will be to that vaccine. For uh, the reason for that is biological because the cells of the immune system mature over time, and so if you give them time to mature, um, then they will be more likely to have a vigorous response on the next exposure. You have to balance that against wanting to achieve immunity as quickly as possible in the context of a pandemic. So initially, there were in the, some of these clinical trials, they tried doing some uh, regimens as quickly as two weeks um, or even less, and other regimens uh, 28 days and so on. The aim being that we would rather get rapid immunity and deal with the longevity issue later um, than give really robust immunity, but have to wait till everybody gets a second dose. So it really depends on context. It depends on the vaccine. It depends on where the evidence is. The bottom line, I guess, is what I'm saying is that since we need to continue masks and, and distancing, even if you got your second dose, you certainly should do that if you got your first dose. And don't worry too much if it takes you, you know, two months before you got your second dose. It's still going to be effective. It might even be more effective. Um, but clearly, we want you to be protected as soon as possible. And it's a question of logistics of making that happen. Um, after your first dose, from about 12 days after your first dose, you're probably protected at about 50% efficacy. Um, and after the second dose, immediately, you're about 91% efficacy. And about a week or, or 10 days after your second dose, that's when you reach 95% efficacy. Not, not the people here, but the people in the trial. That was what we're seeing. In the real world, the effectiveness is likely to be slightly lower than that. But still, one dose is protective to some degree. It halves the risk. That's, that's already something. And that was the level at which licensure emergency use authorization would have been granted had the vaccines not performed as well as they did. We're kind of spoiled by the fact that we got a 95% efficacious vaccine straight off the bat. That's very lucky. We could have easily had a vaccine that was 60 or 70% efficacious. And if you look at seasonal influenza vaccine, sometimes it's 80%, 70% effective. Other seasons, it's 40% effective um, because of the match between circulating flu and, and the vaccine, which is relative guesswork, really. Um, so, you know, we're used to having vaccines that don't work quite as well as this. We're lucky we have a vaccine that works well. A single dose is still very good. It's better than none, much better than none. But ideally, two doses would be good. So get it as soon as it's available, as long as you've got past your 21 days and for Pfizer or 28 yeah. days. Okay, but, I, but at the very least, what we've learned is that if your thing is postponed by a few days or even by a couple of weeks, that's not... Uh, that's, it doesn't that matter at all. Be okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I am on borrowed time, Dr. Brazov. I asked you for 15 minutes and you went on 35. So I think I'm going to uh, let you go. But just to say thank you again for... Thank you for everyone in the world that's benefiting from you. And thank you for... Uh, for giving your time to us and uh, and to this uh, this group of people, we really really appreciate it. And you just uh, God should bless you with uh, strength and uh, and continued great wisdom to to make a difference. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, bless us all. Hopefully, thanks everybody. Thanks for teaching my kids. <laughs> That's much harder <laughs> to teach my kids. It's much harder. All it's right. a great uh, deal. It's a great you. partnership. We'll take it anytime. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cold Two. Hey everyone. Uh, let's just finish up. Okay, happy we had that. One second. All right, happy we had that. I'm sorry we didn't get to all your questions, but um, that is really, he's really a special person, as you saw, and doing uh, important work. So I'm happy you had the chance to hear that. Maybe we'll get, we'll figure out a way to be able to share that with the uh, with the world. I think I got through. Uh, Gabby, did you raise your hand on purpose? She's on mute. 
Gabby says, thank you. Okay, we'll take it. Um, thank you, Gabby. Um, wow, that was a lot of information to take in. If anybody has specific questions, though, please, uh, we will, you know, through the regular channels, try to, to get those questions answered. But I hope that you can, that that was, at the very least, encouragement to you to keep on doing what you're doing to help your colleagues get the appointments that they should be getting. Um, like, as we heard, I think we got 150 who have already had the first shot. So let's let's keep it coming. And we will, um, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll work on that too, because that's, um, that's important. Questions or comments before we go to writer anecdotals? If you're like me, you could, this, you could use this to procrastinate a little bit and keep on talking. Um, questions, Rebecca, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm doing it. I'm not done yet. I'm, just, I'm working on my last couple. Uh, questions or comments? I'm looking, all right. Going once. Rabbi. Yes, who's that? I saw Marcy put in the chat and I was wondering the same thing. Is there a place where people should be logging reactions to vaccinations? Uh, internally for us? Anywhere. Is there somebody who, like, since you were collecting information about what your experience was like at the sites where you got? Uh, that's a great, I, I think that um, you could certainly, if you feel comfortable putting that in the in the thing that we, that we put out, you could certainly do that. That would be information for us. I would also ask you to certainly tell our nurses so we know about it and we can... You know, we can use that information to to help others. Thank you, Shoshana, and thank you for uh, thank you for That's bringing that up. I, I, put, I, I put the link for VR Safe, which is the CDC run thing. Uh, they're also monitoring reactions, and we'll reach out to you if okay. there's something abnormal. That's great. We um we are really trying to uh you know to at least understand what's going on with the um. You know, I think I think for the most part, this is now for seniors. I think that the, that most of the teachers have been able to get appointments, and I know that some of you are still trying. Um, but hopefully, we'll see some improvement uh, with the uh, with the supply chain, and also um, just to being able to match people who are in need with um, with appointments, etc. So please continue to. Um, to send that information in. Tal Buskila has this group, COVID, you know, we have a WhatsApp group going that's really, really helping people. So if you need help, um, please reach out. You have the form that was sent out by email last week. Maybe we'll send it again. Um, and let's just um, keep in mind, Tammy Sclair, and just to clarify, two vaccinated people should not be maskless, not just for their own potential risk, but because if they increase their bubble, they can, yes, correct. In other words, right now, what you just heard again is that you could transmit to others. I think that over time, um, we will find out what, you know, what the, with more data, what the information on that is. But right now, uh, that was the recommendation. You also heard that obviously this question of the, you know, the the level of risk and the level of risk certainly, certainly goes down with vaccinated people. But yes, in other words, and that is in terms of school policy, school po no, no school policy is changing for vaccinated people. By the way, I didn't ask him this, but including testing. In other words, testing will continue to happen. And when we do testing after the vacation, that will be included for those who have um, who have been vaccinated. That's, you know, that might be uh, eventually deemed to be overkill, but right now, um, that's the practice that we're um, that we're following. So uh, um, we'll take it from there. Dina, what was your question, or was that with Dr. Barzev? We missed it. I, I just wanted to know going forward, and I assume based on what he said, that's the case. But someone who's quarantined, um, so, sorry, yeah. someone who's vaccinated, and they have a class going forward, because this will probably be applicable in a number of weeks. If you're fully vaccinated, um, and you've waited that ten to twelve day period. And assuming 75%, let's say, efficacy, will that person have to quarantine fully with their pod? If yeah, I mean, you know, it's a great question. The, the answer is right now, yes. I imagine that some of that guidance will shift. Um, but right now, the answer is going to continue to be yes until otherwise until otherwise noted. So yes, all the all of the restrictions, rules, et cetera, will apply, quarantines, et cetera, will apply right now um, until 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 more stuff gets out there. Usually, you know, it's going to be CDC, local departments of health, um, and general recommendations. And I think that, you know, over time that will definitely shift. Thank you, Deborah. We sent out or we're sending out or we sent out pre yeah, just went out. Pre-registration. So please, please, please do. This is a serious thing. These are good problems. You're 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 the cause of the problems because you're very good at what you do. Uh, but we're going to have waiting lists and pretty much every grade 
Um, so we actually need to know um, from you and from and from everybody else what their uh, what their story is for um, for next year. Um, uh, there's we're done. Oh, three years for kindergarten and many grades already on waiting, even grades that you think are not on waiting lists because we're talking about changing class sizes and things like that. So we'll talk about that more, but please, please, please. It takes about three minutes. So please, 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 like today, actually, just go on and pre-register. Any questions you can call, you can call Deborah May, Deborah Ice, and we can, we'll can we work it out for you, but we want you to pre-register. Please take the time um, to do that. Oh, uh, can you please share the link to the group that's helping people sign up? The link to the, yes, Yael, if you could put that in, if it doesn't make it here, you can put it in the Slack, the link to the group that's helping people and sign up, even in other states, by the way, again, not, not magic, but there are people who are, you know, there's a lot of Florida information going through that thing yesterday and people need help. If we can help them, we're going to try to just share the information that we, um, that we have. Um, <laughs> or just tell Seth, we'll get the info to the right place. That sounds like a good idea. Okay. So we could do that too. Um, all right, guys. I think that's uh, I think that's it. All right. Have a great day. We will be in touch. Stay safe. See you tomorrow. Have fun. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ah, there it is, guys. Thank if you. you want to pick it up. Thank you.